Well, uh, welcome to the Holy Land and this biblical site of Nazareth. We are on Mount Precipice. We're going to be looking at that. But anyway, you can see in the background here, uh, you can see Nazareth. And you can see the uh, Church of the Annunciation. And then just up from that, uh, about four or five hundred yards or meters or so is Mary's Well. And then up from that is a Greek Orthodox Church. There's a synagogue over just to the left of the Church of the Annunciation. It's also called the Basilica of the Annunciation. So at this biblical site of Mount Precipice, we'll be looking at the location of this place and why that's so important. We'll talk about the historical background of this location. We'll be looking at some of the amazing places of interest at this site. We'll see the key events in the Bible that took place here and we'll end with a faith lesson in order to learn the major lessons God desires from us at this important site. So I think you'll find this video very enlightening and transforming to your life. So Nazareth is in the northern part of Israel in the lower Galilee area. And of course, uh, Nazareth was in walking distance of the Sea of Galilee. Christ traversed it often. It's about 15 miles or 24 kilometers southwest of the Sea of Galilee and about three and a half miles or five and a half kilometers southwest of Cana. So Cana is just up the road a ways and we'll be going there. And so it's inland also about 23 miles or around 37 kilometers from the Mediterranean Sea. Now a little bit about the background of Nazareth is Nazareth uh, had an estimated population in the time of Christ of around two, three, maybe a few more uh, hundred people. So it was a very small community. It was a community that knew each other very well. When God gave the nation of Israel their inheritances, he gave their inheritance by tribe, and then within the tribes, then they were given also their portions of land. And of course, they couldn't sell their land. They could rent it out, but every 50 years, it went back to the original owner. So you would have, like right here in Nazareth, you would have people who had the same property for generation after generation after generation. They were family. They knew each other extremely well. They were close-knit. So that gives greater weight to what they intended to do with Christ here. It's where the angel Gabriel announced the miraculous birth of Christ. It's the place where Jesus grew up. This is his hometown. So you can just imagine him. Uh, he ran all over the hills. He walked as he got older. So this is his stomping grounds. Jesus spent more time in Nazareth than any other place on earth. He left Nazareth when he started his earthly ministry and went to Capernaum by the Sea of Galilee to fulfill prophecy, obviously. Uh, but he grew up here and, and was raised here, so he spent roughly 30 years of his life uh, right here. So we'll be in his footsteps. So it was a small farming town. And once again, everyone knew each other. They had olives, they had figs, and they probably farmed some down in the valley. But the reason why Nazareth existed here and the reason why any town would exist is that it had water. Back in ancient times, uh, they did have canals and stuff, but they, you had to have a water source. So there was water here and so this is why the community grew up. Now, interestingly, for some reason, we don't know exactly why, but Nazareth had a bad reputation. We know that uh, Nathaniel said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? So in John 1, 43, it says, the next day he purposed to go to Galilee and he found Philip. And Jesus said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida of the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Then Nathanael said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said, Come and see. So it had a bad reputation. Once we don't know why. We do know when they chose to throw Jesus off headlong that it was something that they commonly did. And the reason why they threw people off was they would just go to their death there and they weren't worth burying. They didn't give people here oftentimes a decent burial. So if it was a criminal or somebody or whatever, 
hey, just take them and throw them off the cliff. They hit the rocks below, they, they die probably a slow death. If they didn't die instantly, then the birds would come and just eat them. And so down below the Mount Precipice here that we're on, there's not today, but there would have been back in Jesus' day, bones and stuff like that. And it's possible it was maybe their trash area as well. And then Jesus lived in Nazareth until he started his earthly ministry at the age of 30. From Nazareth, Christ relocated and set up his ministry base in Capernaum. So when Jesus turned 30, then he moved and went to Capernaum. Why Capernaum? Well, it was on the Via Maris. In fact, at Capernaum, you can see a Roman mile marker, kilometer marker, it marked. And so it was by no accident that Christ chose to minister in Capernaum because he was in Capernaum and did the majority of his miracles. He spent around 60 to maybe 70% of his time around the Sea of Galilee. And so why? Well, all of those miracles, guess where they go if they're on the international highway? All of the knowledge of Jesus travels to Africa, Egypt, it travels to Asia, Europe, so that when the apostles went to share the gospel, they already had knowledge of Jesus. So once again, Israel was placed on the crossroads of the known world so that God could be on display to show himself to the world. So some would say, well, why didn't Christ set up his ministry base in Jerusalem, the spiritual center? Why the backyard podunk, you know, off the way beaten path? Well, it wasn't off the beaten path. Jerusalem was not on the Via Maris. Capernaum was, and so therefore he chose uh, that area. So he lived here until the age of 30, and then he set up his ministry base in Capernaum. It says in Matthew 4, 13, and leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. And once again, you find all throughout the New Testament in Christ's ministry so that it might be fulfilled the continual fulfillment of prophecy. It says in verse 15, the land of Zebulun and the land of Nephtali. This is the prophecy out of Isaiah. The way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. So Galilee had a Gentile population in that time. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So he went to Capernaum, Sea of Galilee, and began his ministry. So he left here and went there. However, Jesus came back to his hometown and he was rejected. It says in Luke 4, 14, it says, and Jesus returned in the power of the spirit to Galilee and a report about him went out through all the surrounding country. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And he stood up and read. Now this synagogue where Jesus preached at here in Nazareth still exists to this day. According to Christian tradition, the church is built on the ruins of the ancient Nazareth synagogue where Jesus studied, prayed, and then preached at in his visit here when they attempted to throw him off the cliff. The synagogue is simply named today the Synagogue Church. Ancient tradition maintains that this synagogue church stands atop the synagogue where Jesus worshiped as a young man. In fact, in AD 570, the anonymous northern Italian named the Pilgrim of Biasensa was the last Western Christian writer to visit Israel before the Muslim conquest that occurred less than a century later. He claimed to have seen not only the adjacent synagogue itself, but the original scriptures from which Jesus had read, as well as the bench on which Jesus used to sit as a young man. During Byzantine times, Christian believers started attending this place 
and in medieval times, the synagogue was turned into a church. The church was later destroyed, but a stone structure marking the location of the first century synagogue is still intact. Its floor is six feet lower than the street level, and its roof is arched, a typical element in medieval architecture. A marble pillar next to its entrance is dated to the Roman period. This column is the only possible genuine remnant of the ancient synagogue. A raised platform in its northern end holds an altar. By local tradition, this is where Jesus read from Isaiah to the local congregation. The current synagogue church is a 12th century crusader structure located in the area of Nazareth Medieval Market, just a few minutes walk from the Church of the Annunciation and directly adjacent to the Greek Catholic Church of the Annunciation. The synagogue church is visited by just a fraction of those coming to see the Church of the Annunciation, perhaps because of its hidden location. The site is maintained by the Melkite Greek Catholics, who added an adjacent modern church which was completed in 1887. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up and read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. And he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. So back in those times, the Bible was on a scroll. And sometimes you'd have to scroll quite a ways to get where you're going. But he knew exactly where to go, right? I mean, he was the Word. In John 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh, it says later. So he was the Word. He knew. He was the author of Scripture. He had, he had written it. So he found the place where it was written of him, and this is what it says. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is a quote out of Isaiah. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath, in the land of Sidon, that is to the north, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. So basically saying these Gentiles found miracles, but you didn't. So those who knew Christ best rejected him and attempted to throw him off a cliff close by to their town. And today this place is called Mount Precipice and that's where we're sitting, that's where we're filming this right now with Nazareth in the background. It says in Luke 4, 28, when they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. Now there's a lot more that was said that is not in scripture, but Christ basically said, I am the Messiah and that you guys are gonna demand all these things of me and that uh, you're going to reject me and he had already experienced that. So he began to state things about them. They get angry, which in our faith lesson we'll talk about, how can we respond? There's some, when God speaks, they get angry. There's some who are gonna receive, but most get angry and reject Christ. And most people today who do reject Christ would probably wanna do the same thing that the people in Nazareth intended to do. So anyway, it says that, and they rose up and drove him out of the city 
and brought him to the brow of a hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. So they led him right through this path here, brought him right up, right out of Nazareth, brought him up here to this cliff area to throw him off headlong to kill him or maim him seriously. And we talked about it as something that they did regularly. There was a lot of people they had thrown off here. It was just what they did. So it says, but passing through their midst, he went away. So right here, you're sitting where those in the synagogue and probably just a little bit farther that way would have intended to throw him off. So you're sitting in the very spot. Jesus would have came right through here. And then he's on the back side of them. They're on this side and he's, they're gonna attempt the mob to throw him off. What does he do? He's on the other side of them, on the, on the edge of the cliff. What's he do? He just walks right through them. What do you think they thought about that? That was a sufficient enough miracle, wasn't it? However, a hard-hearted person, it doesn't matter a lot of times what they see or what they know, they're just gonna reject uh, tragedy. Okay, well, uh, this is a really special here because we are on the path that they would have led Jesus on to throw him off headlong. I mean, it's a dream to walk in the footsteps of Christ, right? So this is uh, Nazareth is just down below us here. So it says that he preached in the synagogue and, and they became outraged at him. And then they led him, it says, to throw him off headlong. So this is the path here and we're going to see the place where they were going to throw him off headlong intending to kill him. Obviously, he, it says he just passed right through their midst, supernaturally just walked right through them and then uh, left. But this is right here is the path. So let's walk the same path that Christ walked up here to be thrown off. Obviously, he was being led by force, right? It wasn't a voluntary and all the people were mad. All the people are angry, taking him up here to, to throw him off. Well, so here we are on the actual Mount Precipice. So Nazareth is behind us. So they brought Jesus up that path and then they intended to cast him off, it says headlong. And so right here is this precipice, this cliff, where they intended to throw him off. And we'll get a shot of it here up close, but you can see it's just straight down. And if they'd have thrown him, and they were gonna not just casually drop him off the side, they were gonna throw him. So if they threw him out, you know, like, like this or whatever, then he would land way down there, maybe 50, 60, 100 feet down, and the rocks are just really jagged, as you can see, and it would have killed a normal human being. And it also reveals that probably Jesus wasn't the first person that they intended to throw off, right? We know that Nazareth had a bad reputation. It says in Scripture, Nathaniel said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? So there were probably quite a few people that were thrown off right here. So what I want to do, and I throughout our, our journey here in the Holy Land, I just really want to try to express this, and I just will work hard at it. But I just want you to realize that you guys are standing in the very spot where Jesus was at. And there was a mob here, and they were intended to throw him off right here. So just let it soak in. I mean, it is a reality. This is, this is it right here. And then scripture says that he just passed through their midst supernaturally. I mean, obviously Christ was destined to die on the cross. So as we were talking on the way up, it's, I mean, he wasn't gonna die this way, obviously, but he just passed through their midst uh, supernaturally. So right here, you're, you're, you're in the footsteps of Jesus. Mob, getting ready to throw him off. Now, as you can see, we have a gorgeous view from this point, so I would like to point out some key locations. Below us is the Jezreel Valley, which is Israel's richest farmland area. It is also where the Via Maris passed through, headed from the coastal plain to the Sea of Galilee. In the distance, you can see the mountains of Gilboa, where a number of events took place one of which was the death of King Saul and some of his sons. Gideon's spring is right before the mountains of Gilboa and is where God led Gideon to choose 300 men to defeat the Midianites. 
you can see Megiddo, which is also called Armageddon, and where part of the last battle at the end of the tribulation period will take place. We have a beautiful view of Mount Tabor as well, which is the believed place where the transfiguration of Christ took place. And we'll see this site in a few days. So as we come to our faith lesson, what are some things that uh, God intended and can teach us today from what happened here? Well, Nazareth, for some reason, had a bad reputation. But God, most often and regularly, places the light in the darkest places, right? Sometimes we have a tendency to run from dark places, but in reality, God wants us to be in those places so that we can bring light in His truth to those places. So I guess the question for us would be, are we willing to go to the dark places? Not do evil things or sinful things, but are we willing to go and minister into those dark places? Now the people of Nazareth largely rejected Christ. So it shouldn't surprise us if people reject us. Christ said, if they reject me, they will reject you. So when people reject us, we shouldn't take that personally. It's just the way it is. Now also, Jesus was rejected by his family members, initially his brothers. He was rejected by his townspeople, his community. So he knows what it is to be rejected. So he understands when we're rejected. He understands, he can identify with us. There's nothing that we experience that he hasn't experienced. So sometimes we might feel really hurt, we might feel really offended when people reject us for who we are, our family rejects us, Some, and it hurts. Christ understands that. It's just a reality, he just understands it. And then lastly, do we reject Christ? by refusing to do what he wants us to do. Maybe we don't reject him to the degree, but we also can be guilty of rejecting Christ. Maybe when we know we should read his word, ah, I don't want to do that. Maybe when he wants us to share Christ with someone, ah, I don't want to do that. Maybe different steps of faith, whether it be ministries or whatever, ah, I really don't want to do that. So in reality, in small ways, we can be guilty of rejecting Christ. So some truths that God has for us right here in Nazareth, some faith lessons that he has, he understands. So I'm wondering, does anyone have any uh, comments or any questions? No, I was just listening to what you said and kind of we're up here and uh, the story you tell kind of explains what brought them to here because they grew up in a small town. Obviously she said, you know, everybody knew that Mary was pregnant, that she was, you know, that in their eyes, they, her and Joseph had committed adultery, and then, this, then Jesus is born, comes back here. Everybody knows that, you know, in their eyes, that's a child of adultery. And now he goes in and says that <laughs> I fulfilled prophecy. And so they're, we know this guy, you know. We, you know, we know, you know, he could, his mom could have been stoned and stuff, and now he says that. So that kind of explains why now they're up here, here wanting to throw him off. That's, that's a great observation. Sometimes we fail to understand the back story, right? There was a lot of history. I mean, these people knew Jesus. They knew him. And so when he begins to make these claims that he's Christ and he's the Messiah, they became outraged. Great observation, Matt. Anyone else, any thoughts? I thought as we were walking up that path, you, you said we're quite likely walking the same path that Jesus walked. And, uh, and I think of in Matthew where he says, if, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. And we think about following Christ, we think about walking behind him, but it's not normally like that. Right, so so First Peter um, 2 says, uh, for you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in these steps. So I was thinking when we're walking up those steps, there's going to be some spots in Israel, very unique spots like Caiaphas's house, where you know you're standing in the bottom of this cistern and you're standing where Christ's feet were standing. And this one I'd never, you know, been up here before, and I'm thinking we're walking the steps that he walked while they're getting ready to throw him off the cliff. 
And so we're at work, and somebody, and there's an opportunity to share Christ. We don't want to open our mouth because somebody might think ill of us. Uh, you might lose a job if you're too outspoken about your faith. Um, in, in many places in the world, you lose your life if you're, outs if you're outspoken about Christ. But you know, the question that the Lord just hit me with is, you know, are those the footsteps you're going to follow? Praise the Lord. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, tremendously accurate, right? Are you willing to take up your cross? One thing we find in Christ is that his commitment level that he calls was not a part-time or a low commitment. It, it was an all. It was a willingness to take up your cross and give it all. And there will be a special place in heaven for martyrs. So whatever we suffer for Christ, we lose nothing. Because the more we suffer, the more we will be rewarded in the afterlife. So suffering is a blessing. That's why when the disciples were persecuted, they, it says they rejoiced to suffer for Christ. Well, thank you for your attentiveness and your participation, and God bless you.